Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. And so this morning, I had every intention of turning our focus to Ezekiel 28, which is a key passage about Satan. But as I was working on the Ezekiel 28 passage, I, I couldn't get away from the fact that Ezekiel 20 is a huge leap forward in the book of Ezekiel from what we were studying yesterday. And so I was, I was really tempted to slow down and keep going through some of these earlier chapters because they've got so much rich material in them. But the overall mission of this podcast is to give you the key chapters of the Bible, not the key chapters of Ezekiel. And so I was just going to move on and I began working on Ezekiel 28. But as I was working on Ezekiel 28, just working on the background review, I realized I can't skip this stuff. And so here's my compromise. And by the way, I'm Russ Brewer, and you're listening to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. It's just great to have you listening in. Uh, so here's my compromise. How about I quickly helicopter into a bunch of key chapters of Ezekiel and just give you the main points of those chapters so you can go back and look at them later on? I actually think that each of these chapters is just going to be great food for your soul, and, and they really probably deserve to be full episodes on their own. But for now, at least, they're just good material for us to know and work through just quickly in this one episode. So let's cover just a handful of these key chapters of Ezekiel to understand what they say and how they move the message of Ezekiel forward. For instance, Ezekiel 13 is a great chapter that's filled with a ton of rich teaching on false prophets. But we've already covered similar passages on false prophets already in Isaiah and Jeremiah. So I'll just mention that the message of the false prophets in Ezekiel 13 is that of peace, peace, peace. I mean, peace sells, right? Who wants to hear the difficult teachings of God's word? I mean, just give people messages of peace and hope. <laughs> now, that may sound good, but we should be careful with this. If we come across a Bible teacher who's always giving us happy messages, we may be listening to a false teacher. I mean, God's word fills our soul with joy, but that joy comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit who concurs with the accurate preaching of his word and not manufactured messages about how everything's going to get better and better and better. By and large, I mean, when you read the Bible, by and large, the Bible is corrective in nature. And if someone's teaching is, is also not just generally corrective in nature, we should double check to be sure that they're actually teaching the message of God. Sure, they shouldn't be harsh, and there's all kinds of ways we can go off into the broccoli patch. But by and large, God's word is calling us to know him and obey him and walk in faith then, and hopefully we're just filling our life, our mind, our soul with teaching that just helps us to know God more and walk according to his word. Along those lines, chapter 13 also warns about putting our faith in physical trinkets. In Ezekiel 13, the trinkets that they were putting their faith in were these magical wristbands, and, and some women were putting some special head coverings on the heads of their statues. Probably in their day and age, this all made sense, and they were apparently thinking this was going to help them in their distress. Now, a modern natural application in our day would be things like good luck charms or horseshoes or rabbit's feet or, or even so-called religious things that we might put around our house thinking that we'll curry favor with God and hopefully ward off evil. Let's not be people who do that. Let's just put our trust in God. Another sobering verse from Ezekiel 13 is verse 22, where righteous people were being discouraged. And it's just amazing how in a twisted world, they will twist accusations of all kinds to discourage righteous people who won't play those kinds of games. Let's just never be people who discourage the righteous. Okay, now with that quick overview of Ezekiel 13, it's obvious this is a very powerful chapter, and, and maybe I should create a podcast for it down the road. Going on, another powerful passage in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14 speaks about idols in our hearts, and it condemns people who may not have outward idols, but they have inward idols in their hearts. And this is a key principle in our day and age, because we may not be worshiping physical idols, but many times we have idols that we worship in our heart, even if no one knows about them. And this is a good spot for us just to pause and remember that an idol isn't something that we really, really want or that we think is really great. I mean, we, sometimes people say it this way. They say, oh, that guy is worshiping his car. And, and that may be the case, but probably not the way we think. You see, the, the issue isn't valuing something, nor is it really even about priority, though it can be, but it's really about power. I mean, of course, it isn't healthy to let something dominate our life, nor is it righteous and holy to allow anything to take priority over God. And, and if we do, we probably do have an idol in our hearts. But when you think about it, everything we've been looking at over the last few months, or even in our study of Ezekiel 8, where the people were worshiping creatures and the god Tammuz and the sun, it wasn't that snakes were suddenly really, really important to the people or that they really liked them. 
is that the snake represented a God they thought would help them. Remember that the people were saying, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. In other words, God is not giving them what they want, and so they're going to try something else. And so an idol, then, is, is anything we're looking to to give us things like peace and provision, happiness, or, or anything else. An idol is something we think has the power or the capacity to give us what we want or need or crave. And so a car could be an idol if we think it will give us happiness, but so can a candy bar or a glass of wine or a hobby or even good things like family, health, good citizenship. For that matter, an idol can even be education, a job, vacation, some recognition or status or achievement. An idol is anything that we're looking to as the source of something we want. And that's the key. If we think that this thing is the source of what we want, that really may be an idol. The fact is, God is the source of everything in our life, from our happiness to our bank account to our social standing. He sovereignly bestows these things on us as we walk with Him by faith, trusting in Him and walking in His ways. And so Ezekiel 14 is warning that people can create idols in their heart where they think that these other things are the source of what they want, and, and they go to those things rather than the Lord. Now, the key to dealing with these idols is to recognize them and lay them before the Lord to do away with, and He will. The Lord doesn't want us to have any idol before Him, and He will spiritually crucify any idol in our heart that we would lay before Him. We just need to come to the Lord and prayerfully say to Him, Lord, I have sinfully thought that my job would give me meaning and happiness in life. It is an idol that I have thought would give me only what you can give. Please forgive me, Lord, of this idol crucified in my heart so that I would seek these things only from you in the way that glorifies you. Now, I've prayed that prayer or prayers like that countless times, and, and countless times I've seen the Lord crucify these idols in my heart. God wants us to have no idols before Him and no idols in our hearts. Okay, so that's all pretty profound, and we could just stop right here, except that we have two more chapters to go through. So now let's look at Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18 contains the famous teaching, the soul who sins shall die. And this is a key biblical principle because in God's justice, people will be judged for their own sins and not the sins of others. Likewise, people will be reckoned for their own righteousness, not the righteousness of others either. And the example given in Ezekiel 18 is that a man may be righteous and walk with God, but then he might have an unrighteous son who is condemned by God. And the point is, is that the father's righteousness won't be extended to his son. And that son will be judged for his own sins and rebellion, even if dad was righteous. But the passage goes on to say that if a wicked son then has a son who himself is righteous, that righteous son, the grandson here now, he won't be condemned for his dad's wickedness. And thus the soul who sins shall die, and he will die for his own sins, not for the sins of others. Now, if we're uncomfortable with this, just this whole general principle, because we think about the fact that there is none righteous and we all deserve condemnation, that's all true. That's why we need Jesus Christ and his atoning blood. The point of this passage is about keeping the old covenant law. Uh, it's not about whether or not a person is truly perfect or if they deserve heaven, because God's grace is how anyone is ever saved. But the terms of the old covenant require that the people keep the law. And the point is that if a person does, then they will stand with God. And if they don't, they will be condemned by God, even if everyone around them obeys God, even if their entire family obeys God. It's up to them individually to obey the Lord. Now, when it comes to a few places in the Bible where whole families or communities are condemned, that's because they all partook of that particular sin. And you see that clearly in the example of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Both partook of the sin and, and both were condemned. And so when we see places in Scripture where a group of people die or are judged for some sins, we need to recognize that in those situations, they were all involved, even if that passage doesn't delineate the specific involvement of every person. They were all involved. That's why they were judged. Now, as for why Ezekiel even covers this point, it's because the Lord is telling the people, he's basically saying to them, if you repent, you can be restored to me. Even if no one in your family repents, even if everyone is still rebelling against me, you can repent, you can call upon me, and you can be forgiven. God wants to forgive us. And the final verse of chapter 18 even ends with the Lord saying, he says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. God wants us to live and he calls us to come to him for mercy and grace and salvation. Just another great chapter there, chapter 18. Now let's quickly move on to Ezekiel 23. 
Ezekiel 23 is a very unsettling passage, and if you read it, you'll see why. In Ezekiel 23, the Lord gives a graphic metaphor for the sins of the people and their consequences. In it, in that chapter, the Lord describes the sexual sins of the people in great detail. And the point is that God actually names names of those people, the nations, that will bring about God's judgment upon the nation of Israel and Judah. And so that then tees up an extended set of judgments over several chapters of the very nations themselves. They're being judged by God too. And so beginning in chapter 25 and going on to chapter 32, the Lord gives specific proclamations of judgment against Ammon and Moab and Edom and Philistia and Tyre and Sidon and Egypt. All these nations are going to be judged by God. And then in chapter 33, the Lord brings his focus back onto the children of Israel, and the Lord wants the people to know, first, just because God will use some of these nations to judge Israel doesn't mean that these nations are now in covenant with God. They're not. Second, since God will judge these nations too, Israel better wake up. And then in chapter 33 and 34, the Lord returns his warning to Ezekiel to be a faithful watchman to proclaim God's word. And the Lord also condemns the false prophets and the unfaithful shepherds, and and he lays the groundwork for the final chapters of Ezekiel that speak of the worldwide war against Israel at the end of days, and how God will deliver them and then establish his messianic kingdom. We'll cover all of that in detail in the upcoming days. Okay, so I know that was a quick run-through of several chapters, but we have fulfilled all righteousness. These are some key chapters for the book of Ezekiel. There's some great chapters in the Word of God, and they're good stuff for us to know. Now, Tomorrow, we're going to zero in on Ezekiel 28 and unpack what it has to say to us about Satan. But before we leave today's chapters, by way of application, let's be on guard against listening to false teachers. Let's not discourage people who are pursuing righteousness. Let's not allow idols to be set up in our heart. Let's lay them before the Lord to crucify. Uh, Let's trust that God accepts any sinner who repents, including us. And finally, let's realize that God's word contains historical events. So let's trust its message for us, past, present, and future. And so with that, thanks for listening. I look forward to catching up with you tomorrow. And until then, have a great day and God bless.